Hi, my name is Mike Daniel with StoneLife.org, and I want to talk a little bit about our identity in Christ. We are uh, in a series called Sainted, understanding who we are with God having made us saints, made us his inheritance, made us all of the things that he both calls us to be and empowers us with the new identity that we have by the finished work of Christ. You know, I, uh, years ago, worked with different uh, organizations and did training and consulting, and I went into one organization uh, in uh, the Arkansas area, a very large uh, Fortune 500 company, and uh, because I was friends with some of the executive staff that I was working with at the time and had worked with them for quite some time, uh, when I went to work with them, they had signed me in, and I just kind of got a little guest badge and walked right in with them into some of the executive offices of their uh, facility and, and had a, a great time consulting and coaching and training with that organization. Now, after several years of this, I showed up one time at their facility to do some work with them. I was scheduled to be there. They were expecting me, but I couldn't get in. They wouldn't let me into that section of the building. And uh, so they called one of the people that I was there to meet with, and they came up and met with me and said, sorry, we can't let you in here. We've got to fill out all of these different forms. You're uh, now no longer considered an executive guest. Uh, which was my status previously, now you are uh, a vendor. You're someone that we're buying things from and you're selling something to us. And in this case, it was uh, coaching and consulting and training services. But it was uh, incredible that one day I was an executive guest and could more or less go anywhere in the facility. And then the next day, uh, I am a vendor and I have to fill out lots of paperwork in order to get a guest badge that doesn't allow me to go into the very rooms, the very offices, the very conference rooms, the very training facilities that I was previously uh, uh, not only able to go into, but in some cases was in charge of. Uh, so it, I wonder how often we realize our identity, who we are, and the role that we have, what that means in terms of our access in life. You know, you've heard the phrase, it's not uh, what you do or what you know, it's who you know. Uh, I think that's very true, but in this case, my identity, who I was to that company, changed. And because of that, it didn't matter who I knew. It didn't matter uh, where I had been or what I had done previously. I could not get in to certain places in that company without being an executive for that company. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you were not part of the elite? You were not one of the folks allowed into a certain place or a certain area, a certain section uh, uh, of, a, of a building or a company or an organization? Maybe you've been excluded from a club or a fraternity or a, a clique of people. There's a popular crowd or the, uh, you know, for me, I was a band geek. No one, you know, that wanted to be in our group couldn't get into our group, but there were always the, the more popular uh, folks in a, different, uh, in a given group. I wonder what that looks like in, in our life. You know, our identity in Christ has a very similar effect as being a, an executive guest <laughs> did at that organization. You and I have access to God in a way that the rest of the world does not. If they're not a believer, if they're not a child of God, if they're not a saint, then there's a specific role that you and I have as saints that God has given us as part of our identity that we get to live out and come into his very presence, get to be a part of his work in other people's lives, have complete access to him uh, at all times. Uh, in fact, the, the area that I'm talking about is being a priest. Uh, you may know this, but 1 Peter 2.9 says that you you as a believer, not because of your behavior, not because of what you've done, not because of what you haven't done, not because you've signed a card or raised a, a hand or walked an aisle or even said a prayer, but because of the identity that God has given you through the finished work of Christ on the cross, because you have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are a royal priest. He says you're part of a royal priesthood. You're a priest. In uh, the time that Peter was writing, that had great significance, that, that term priest or, or being part of the, the priesthood. In uh, Jerusalem, the temple was divided into several sections. 
there was a, a Gentile court where Gentiles, non-Jews, people like, like me, could come and worship God and offer a sacrifice or have a sacrifice offered, though they couldn't enter into the temple. In fact, they couldn't even get into the outer court of the temple. So they had set up sort of an extended court. It'd be kind of like going to the stadium to watch the uh, a professional uh, Spurs game, a basketball game, or a football game, to go and watch a, a professional sports team, but you can't even get into the stadium because you don't have the ticket. You can stay in the parking lot, you can tailgate all day long, but you don't get to watch the game at all. You have to stay outside. That's kind of what that Gentile court was. You can't come into the temple at all. Not even the outer court, not even the nosebleed section of the stadium, but you can come outside uh, and we'll designate a place for you to come close to being in, but not being in. You can't participate, but you can come close. Now, that's where you and I would be relegated in uh, in Peter's early life before Christ died and was resurrected. That was our status. We couldn't even get into the nosebleed section. But then uh, that's the, the Gentile court. Once you went into the temple, there was an outer court for Jews to come. You didn't have to be a priest. You didn't have to have special status. You just had to be a Jew. And the priest would come and receive sacrifices from uh, the, the Jews. They would take their sacrifices and offer uh, those on behalf of the Jew uh, that came and offered it. And that was one of the, the, the roles that the priests had in interceding for uh, the Jewish nation. So the Jews would come and offer sacrifices for their known sins, and the priests would receive those and uh, monitor the altars and light lamps and do all the things that the priests were in charge of on behalf of the Israelites. But there was an, uh, that, that's sort of the, the outer court. But there was an inner court, uh, or the, um, uh, the holy place, is what it was called at the time, that if you were a priest, you could enter into the holy place. They had a, an altar and specific lamps and incense that they burned to God in the holy place. And anyone who was part of the, the tribe of Aaron, they were descendants of Aaron. You remember back uh, when Moses and uh, uh, Aaron led the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, anyone who was in Aaron's line, uh, or, or that was called the Levitical line, anyone who was a Levite, uh, was part of this priestly order. And because you were a priest, if you were one of Aaron's descendants, you could go into the holy place. So not only were you getting past the court of the Gentiles, which was really outside the temple, and, and, and in getting through even that outer court uh, for the Jews to come and offer their sacrifices and participate in worship, but you could come into the holy place, the actual temple of God, kind of the inner court. It's called the outer court, but it's the, the temple of God where you get to serve God and serve people. It's that in-between place. You're not yet in the innermost court, the holy of holies, but you're in the holy place, a consecrated place for the work of God. And inside that, there is actually a, a further uh, designation. There's a place called the holy of holies. And not just any priest could enter the holy of holies. There was only one. He was called the high priest. And he could only enter once a year. And he would actually take blood from the sacrifice for the Israelites. And he would enter into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, that inner sanctum of the temple of God. And he would bring that, uh, the blood of that sacrifice and he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. So there were two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant where the uh, Ten Commandments uh, were. And there was a, a seat set up on top of that between two cherubim. And he would, uh, the, the high priest, one priest, would uh, put drops from that sacrifice, drops of blood from that sacrifice, on the mercy seat. And God would come and would intervene. Uh, uh, the priest would intervene for the Israelites for the sins they did not know they had committed. And he would do that once a year. Um, and he alone could do it. And if he walked in and hadn't gone through the right purification process, if he hadn't done everything correctly, if he didn't come in with uh, the right sacrifice, uh, the right blood, if he didn't perform uh, those duties just as he was supposed to, and it was uh, extensive what those requirements were, then he would immediately be killed. In recent years, there have been uh, excavations uh, around that temple area. And uh, in the, that outer, outer court, the Gentile court, not even the outer court within the temple, but the the, not even the nosebleed section can't even get in the stadium Gentile court outside the temple. There were actually signs that more or less said, uh, you know, 
don't enter or you're taking your life in your own hands. You'll be responsible for your own death that will immediately follow. You know, it's, it's this really dire warning that you're going to die and it's going to be your own fault and you just need to know that, so don't even enter. Don't even think about entering the temple. That's where you and I would have been relegated to as non-Jews if you're not Jewish. It's where I would have been relegated to as a non-Jew. Couldn't even enter. So think about the most famous people that you know. We're on the kind of the basketball uh, theme a little bit. So think about uh, the sports team maybe in a nearby city where you are. Here it's the Spurs in San Antonio. Think about that team, how uh, grand their status is in, in the city. So if I ran into a, a Tim Duncan or, uh, in fact, just yesterday I was sitting in Starbucks and saw uh, Matt Bonner walk in, one of the Spurs uh, players, and get a drink and talk to a few people and leave. People wanted his autograph and were standing uh, around, uh, you know, kind of talking about him. Look at him and what car is he driving? And everybody treated him with such status. And the reason is because there's only a handful of guys that are good enough to play on the Spurs. There aren't too many guys that get to play in the NBA, much less on that team that makes it, you know, if not to the finals, to the semis almost every single year. Very elite group, and yet if you think about it, you know, there's a couple dozen guys that, uh, you know, either walk on or invited or drafted or get to play with or, or uh, coach with or are uh, somehow affiliated with that team. Um, and there's dozens of teams in the, in the NBA, so you're talking about potentially hundreds of players in the NBA who have that kind of elite status at, throughout the U.S. Uh, now, consider for a second, you think about the elite status that we're talking about with the priesthood and the high priest and entering the Holy of Holies. That's one guy in the entire world who gets to enter into that place. And he has to do it only under the exact specifications, that complete total letter of the law, uh, the ritual that he had to go through in order to be in such a condition that he could enter. So it's only one guy. It's only once a year. It's only on very specific circumstances and under very specific obligations and regulations that he is able to enter into that most holy place. You and I could be standing out and we watch maybe a priest or two occasionally walk in and out, but we're all waiting to see that one guy who can do that. How excited he must be to be that one guy, and at the same time, how terrified must he be at the dire consequences of everything doesn't go just right. You and I are that level of priest. In fact, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, the writer to the Hebrews makes a, a, a statement that I think is worth us looking at. Here's what he says in uh, Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. He says, Brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that's the sacrifice, that's the blood that gives us entrance. And it's for all of us, not just for that one individual. Since we have confidence to enter into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain. There was a curtain dividing the holy place from the most holy place. God rent that veil, just ripped it in two from top to bottom, signifying that at Christ's death, his finished work allowed for anyone to enter into that place by his grace and by his sacrifice. So he's saying that we uh, can enter with confidence into the holy places by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, so he's the one that's interceded for us, let us, verse 22, let us draw near to that place of God, to the throne room of God, to the actual most holy place that's in heaven where God exists and, and where he lives, where he is seated. Not the place that he's come that is a, a copy, an imitation of the most holy place, but the actual residence and throne room of God.